falling away to the Antichrist. I want you to start reading with me verse in the second chapter, second Peter, verse 17. He's, he's speaking to the church. And certain ones in the church. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that would clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. But if whom of a man is overcome, the same as he brought into bondage. Now listen to this. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ... These people claim to be saved to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that. And then it says, then they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now folks, listen to me. There are going to be Christians overcome by the spirit of Antichrist that's at work right now. They're going to be overcome. These are those who have escaped the pollutions of the world, who were delivered by the power of God through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But now they've turned aside, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. They have knew the way. They knew the way of righteousness. Then, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog has turned to his own vomit again. The sow that was washed to her own wallowing in the mire. How many, look at me please. How many do you know who have turned away from God? And they're going back to their old habits. They've gone back to their old world. Folks, I'm going to tell you, you don't just backslide. You don't just fall away from the Lord. Now, he has to be talking about the church because what does the sinner have to fall away from? He can't fall away from anything. He's already in the pit. The only falling away are those who have something. You don't just fall away from Jesus. You fall into something. It's not just a falling away. It's falling into. You fall away from Christ and you fall into the spirit of Antichrist. No one simply backslides. It's a falling into something. Falling into the spirit that's in the world trying to take control. Now folks, listen to me. John proves that the spirit of Antichrist is powerfully at work in the church. I want you to go to 1 John 4 now. Verse 3. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that, what? Spirit of Antichrist. That's what I've been talking about. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now, what? It's in the world. It's in the world now. John said, you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. You heard a man is going to come and be worshipped. But he said, wake up. That spirit is already at work. And he's talking to the church. That spirit is already here. The spirit of Antichrist is at work. Even now, already in the world, that spirit of Antichrist. He is absolutely in control. There is always going to be a Christ on your throne. I don't care where you are, serving Jesus or serving the Lord, there will always be a Christ on this throne. It will either be Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, or the Antichrist. There will be a Christ. Every man walking these streets has a Christ on his throne. We know the Antichrist is in full control of the secular media. All secular television, theater, all the networks, all the printed material all now are under the control of the spirit of Antichrist. What, who but Antichrist could so bias the American press and so bias the editors and the writers and the actors so that abortion is called a right rather than a sin? Who but the Antichrist could justify now euthanasia? Did you hear recently, uh, read in the newspaper, a uh, psychiatrist now in the United States who believes in euthanasia, killing off the old and infirm. He's willing to kill off anybody who's mentally ill. Who but Antichrist is a killer? Kill off the old and the infirm. It, we ought to be shocked here in the United States because in the Philippines and in Asia, they honor and they revere their old folks. Those who are old, they're revered. Here, we want to kill them. Who but the spirit of Antichrist could be behind it? Who but Antichrist could mock everything that's sacred and holy and worshipped and filthy 
movies and wicked, vile programs on television. The Antichrist is producing MTV. Literally, the Antichrist spirit is in full control of Fox television. I, I read, I don't watch that stuff but, uh, because I don't have television, but MTV, from what I read, and Fox television, in a newspaper, you just look at some of the reviews and some of the absolute filth. Who but the Antichrist? Who but the spirit of Antichrist could be behind it? And folks, he's getting bolder and bolder. Our society is on the brink of becoming a raging hell. But I'm telling you right now, all over the United States, the spirit of Antichrist is absolutely establishing churches. That's exactly what this new uh, outsider-friendly gospel is all about. Who but the Antichrist would go out door to door and knock on doors and say, do you go to church? No. Well, what would you like your church to be like so we could get you to come? And based on a survey of what people want, they don't want sermons so they have skits. They don't want two hours, they want one hour. And they want no conviction. And so what we have now is another gospel with no cross, no repentance, no judgment. But you are allowed to sit there and be soothed in your sins. And you are told about the grace and the mercy of God. But nothing of His judgment, nothing of hell, nothing but heaven and mercy and grace has become a license to sin. So now, when they've been prepared for nothing, not prepared to live, what are preachers going to do when they stand before the throne of God? And these people have not been prepared for eternity. They don't even have their heard a message on hell. Never heard a reproving message. What's going to happen when those preachers stand before God? It's a damnable thing from the pits of hell. It's the Antichrist spirit. Oh, but Antichrist can tell people they can drink from two cups. The cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. 1 Corinthians 10. I'll tell, I'll tell you something. As long as I'm in this pulpit, there will not be one person, and I know that too with Brother Carter, we will not babysit this people. You're going to hear the heart of God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to God. Now I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of devils. You can't be partakers of the Lord's table in the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You know, folks, I, I have a pastor friend who just delights to get up and tell this congregation, if, if you are really mature in Christ, you can handle all of this stuff. He's talking about movies, he's talking about television, he's talking, if you're mature, you can handle it. No, folks, it's not a matter of handling it. It's a matter that you can't have fellowship with devils. It's a matter you can't drink out of two cups. You drink the Lord's cup or the devil's cup. You can't sip out of both sides. You say, Pastor, that, it's scary. How can a Christian be overcome by the spirit of Antichrist? Well, there are two causes Paul gives in 2 Thessalonians. Go back, please, to 2 Thessalonians, 2nd chapter. Cause number one. Now, folks, if you're ever going to be given over to the spirit of Antichrist, here are the reasons. I'm going to give you two. They receive not the love of the truth. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, look this way, please. Verse 12 says, And they will all be damned who believe not the truth. Most Christians simply endure the truth and don't appropriate it to their hearts. Will you please go to Jeremiah, the fifth chapter? And folks, I'm preaching you Bible. Chapter 5, verse 1. Run, run you to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof. If you can find a man, if there be any that executed judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I'll pardon it. And though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they've not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they've refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They've refused to return. 
Look at me, please. This, this is so very vile. God's saying, Jeremiah, go find me some man. Go find me anybody that just has a heart for the truth. I'll pardon that one. And I'll use, but he said, look what's happening to the people. They say that they love me. They say that I rule in their lives. But he says, they don't receive correction anymore. They don't want to be reproved. There's anger in their heart. They're not grieving at the preaching of the word. When it cuts to the marrow of the bone, they call it anger. In, in, in verse 30, he said, they're not stricken. They don't grieve. They refuse to receive correction. They've made their horses, hearts uh, harder than a rock. They say, the Lord lives in me. Most people sitting here this morning would say, oh, I love God's word. I, I, I haven't lost my love for the word of God. Let me give you three ways to determine whether or not you have the love of the word of God in your heart. All right, first of all, you have lost your love for the word of God if it's a difficult job for you to get to church and you're bored and you don't look for it and you no longer look forward to the assembling of yourself with believers the scripture said forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the matter of some is but exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching the Lord is saying the closer we are to the coming of the Lord the more perilous the times the more important it is that you gather with God's people there are some that get so excited they, they just love coming to church. They come every time the doors are open. Now, I know some of you have family obligations. You have job obligations. And God understands that. I'm talking about those who sit at home. Those who become bored. They don't want to hear the message anymore. They're just bored. It, the house of God is not alive to them anymore. They drag themselves. If you're dragging yourself to this church, God help you. You're opening yourself to the spirit of Antichrist. The second way you can know that you're losing your love is by reading someone else's name into the message instead of your own. You can hear a raging, powerful message and say, Oh, thank God he's finally reaching brother so-and-so. Thank God, Sister Smith. She's got it. She's getting it. God, pour it on her. How many of you have taken this message to heart right now. How many of you being moved and convicted in your own heart and you're not thinking about anybody else, you're saying, God, pour the word into my heart. <laughs> Sign number three, when reproof angers you rather than humbles you. But you've said it not on my counsel. You did not want my reproof. You despised all my reproof. Proverbs 1, 30. Correction is grievous unto those who forsake the way. I've heard people say, oh, uh, I've heard instead of Brother Carter's messages like mine, it's too hard. He's angry. Oh, you better believe we are angry at the devil and sin and everything that would attack God's people because we're shepherds. We're angry at that and not at people. But the Bible said, correction is grievous to those that forsake the way. And he that hateth reproof shall die. He that hateth reproof shall die. All right, let me, cause number one is a, is a loss of love for the word of God. Cause number two, verse 12, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Look at me. Pleasure madness. Pleasure madness. Folks, I'm coming near the end, but I've got to get this into your heart, if you will, please. That they had pleasure in unrighteousness. I want to prove to you right now that in the last days that the lovers of pleasure are going to be more inside the church than outside the church. When we think of lovers of pleasure, we're thinking of gamblers and we're thinking of prostitutes, we're thinking of drug addicts, we're thinking of the jet set, we're thinking of those that are out in the bars and the racetracks, we're thinking all the lovers of pleasure are there. And you know what the Bible says? Second Timothy. Verse 1, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despised of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away look at me listen to this list blasphemers unholy truth breakers false accusers fierce traitors in God's house 
This isn't God's house, folks. That's what Paul is talking to Timothy about. He said, beware. These are going to be, this is going to be the spirit of Antichrist in the last days. They're going to be those who are in love with their pleasures, the pleasures of unrighteousness. The pleasures of unrighteousness. He said, because of this, this Antichrist spirit is going to come in. Because they don't love the truth and because they're given over to the love of pleasure. Now, it says more than the love of God. It intimates that there's a measure of the love of God. But there's more of the love of the world. He's talking about so-called believers. And folks, if you sit here this morning, you have not laid down the pleasures of this world. And he's talking about the pleasures of unrighteousness. I I would, before I close, I have to get this off my heart. Listen to me now. Because you you will stand on the, before the judgment seat and I'm going to be there when you pass under the rod. I am totally convinced now, more than ever, that cable television, filthy movies, both in the theater and the home VCRs, is the number one cause, is going to be the number one cause of hearts being prepared for the Antichrist. The number one. Because the eye is the gate to the heart. And he's going to march right through the eye and take control and sit on the throne of the heart because of filthy, corrupted, jaded eyes. You go ahead and you go to the show, go to a movie, pluck down your five or six dollars, and you sit there. And listen to me good enough. You sit there. And you sit there while there's blood and violence. And you sit there while the name of Jesus Christ is cursed and mocked and run through the mud and trampled. And the name of your holy God is cursed. And I'm going to tell you what you've done. You've just drunk from the cup of the devil. You have fellowship with demons and you've provoked God to jealousy. And you have supported the Antichrist spirit. And the Antichrist spirit that Satan Satan sees where you're at. He knows where you're sitting in the seat of the ungodly. And you're going to sit there and you're going to take that. You rent a movie and put it in your VCR. Now folks, I'm, I'm not standing here uh, saying in our office we have VCRs. And we watch the tapes that come in. We are taping this right now on, on video. I, I'm not against that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you go and you go past... Those dirty movies are even PG-13 now. Even PGs curse the name of Jesus. Do you not even have the grace to get up and walk out? Do you sit there? You wouldn't sit there and let them curse your wife. Or your husband. You wouldn't sit there and let them curse your... They named your children like that. You would get up and scream and say, stop it and run out. And yet you'll sit there and let the name of your Christ... Be maimed, sit in front of television and watch filthy, filthy, rotten stuff, and let that spirit of Antichrist seep into your soul. Provoking the Lord to jealousy. You know what it is? It's called a sacrifice to the devil. That's what God calls it a sacrifice to demons. God help us. Now, before I close, I'm going to give you the good part. Hallelujah. Go back to 2 Thessalonians. They're going to be just a precious body, Paul says, who are going to rise up against the spirit of Antichrist, and they are going to stand strong. They will never be overcome. They're going to overcome the world, the flesh, the devil. They're going to overcome the wicked one, the Bible says. Hallelujah. Verse 13, 2 Thessalonians, 2 chapter. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Here's that special people. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through what? Sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Oh, look look at for just a minute. I really believe that this church, the great majority that are sitting here this morning, you're here because you love the truth. You're not afraid to be reproved. And because of that, God sanctifies your spirit. He sanctifies your mind. He convicts you when you've done wrong. So that you don't run out there saying, oh, everything is all right. But you examine your heart before the Holy Ghost. The Word, a sharp two-edged sword, pierces and it heals you. Hallelujah. 
Wherefore, He called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand firm or fast and hold the traditions which have been taught by word of our epistle or our epistle. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us, given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Hallelujah. Folks, keep your heart open to the Word. Love the Word of God. God will establish you. When that Antichrist spirit comes in like a flood, the Word of God lifts up a standard against it, cannot make an inroad to you. The more wicked this world becomes, the more righteous you will become. In the name of the Lord. I'm going to give you one last verse, Psalms 125. I want you to take this promise home with you. Psalms 125. Folks, you got to memorize this. First three verses. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed. Oh, let the devil raise. Let the Antichrist spirit come. You won't be moved because you're on the word of God. Hallelujah. Verse 2, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. And listen to this. For the rod of the wicked, that's the rod of the Antichrist, the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Look at me. He's got a rod. That means authority. But his authority and his power and his reign will not come upon the righteous. Shall not rest upon you. But God said, I'll give you power and authority. You will not be overcome by Satan. You will overcome the world and overcome. This is the faith that overcomes the world. Even, even the testimony that overcomes the world. Even our faith. We are excited that John Gray and Avender Gray are going to be your pastors. And I really believe that John and Avender have always been anointed. But the anointing that is going to fall on them now that they're senior pastors is going to do amazing damage to the kingdom of God. So I'm excited about that. Now this is called the drenchinator. You see it? The drenchinator. And the drenchinator operates by... <laughs> <laughs> I'm praying about whether to follow through on this illustration. Uh, what I love about our church is you have different races, different faces, different um, backgrounds, but people are committed to one cause, and, and it makes So it's not special. a sin in your church to have an abortion? Um, that's the kind of conversation we would have finding out your story, where you're from, what Work you believe. It. Like, yeah, I mean, God's the judge. People have to live to their own convictions. And I think if I have to tell you, um, that's, such a, that's such a broad question to me. I'm going, I'm going higher. I want to sit with somebody and say, well, where do you believe? Um, now, you put that together, and I'm talking about a gospel that's been invented in hell and is now being propagated all of the United States. It's a suitable, acceptable, convenient a gospel that has yielded to the desires and the weakness of sinful men. I call it the gospel of accommodation because it's adapting and adjusting the gospel uh, to appease and attract sinners. This gospel accommodation is primarily an American cultural invention to ease our lifestyle. It appeals primarily to white America, rich and prosperous. It was invented out of hell itself. This new gospel is sweeping the America and the nation is influencing ministers of every denomination. It's giving birth to mega churches. Some of the largest churches in the United States are involved in this gospel. It's a non-confronting, convenient gospel, adapted. It is spoon-fed to the congregation by uh, skits, humorous skits and drama, short, non-abrasive, 20-minute messages, and it's all called seeker-friendly. 
the seeker-friendly churches. And one of these days, there may be somebody move into the city and try to bring one of these churches right into New York City. They are springing up now overnight and suddenly thousands attend. This new gospel is being propagated by bright, young, intelligent, ta talented ministers. They, they came upon a formula by which you can go into any city, in any town, and almost overnight build a mega church. And as I understand this formula, you begin by going into the community with your workers and you pull the community to find out what the sinner found offensive about attending church. Well, why don't you attend church? And what was offensive about it? And what would it, what would we have to do to bring you back into the church? What would make you comfortable? What would you like to see? You don't like choirs? We'll do away with choirs. You, you, you don't like suits in church? You come the way you choose? Uh, just tell us what you want. And they survey the community and then sit in their, uh, with their computers and in their conference rooms and they design a program that will make it comfortable for the sinner and make it friendly for, they rather they call it sinner friendly, they would call it seeker friendly and try to attract them to come into the house of God. It's becoming the most prosperous, most flourishing of all religious movements in the history of America. The churches are run like corporations, the pastor is the CEO, chief executive officer. And it's big business. And this formula has now been cleverly packaged and it is now being pushed in seminars all over the United States. It sounds good, what they say sounds very good. It sounds spiritual in its goals. It sounds like Jesus is the central theme. And folks, I'm not going to name any names because I'm not talking about the character of these men. I'm talking about the gospel that they preach. I am here to remind you that Paul the Apostle warned of the coming of another gospel which we have not preached. He said there is coming another gospel that's going to preach another Jesus. You'll hear his name. It'll sound sweet, but it's not the Jesus that I preach, Paul said. It's not the true Jesus. Paul goes on, or Paul was amazed, he said that you were so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. Folks, listen to me. There is in the land right now with thousands of people sitting under another gospel, another Jesus, being preached by ministers who have lost the touch of God and been transformed into angels of light, the common, the deceive, if possible, even the elect of God. Paul goes to warn the church, it's really not another gospel, but it's a perversion of the gospel of Christ, which is really not another, Paul said, but there'll be some that trouble you and pervert or change the gospel of Christ. He said, they're going to change it. They're going to accommodate the sinner. They're going to accommodate their pleasures. They're going to accommodate all of their needs, and they're going to design a gospel with their own Christ, with their own doctrine. And then this awful warning from Paul. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, but that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Folks, I didn't say that. The Apostle Paul said it. If anybody preached another gospel, what you've heard, if anyone preached anything but the crucified Christ, if anyone preached anything that appeases man in his sin, that's not the gospel you heard from me, Paul said, and anyone preaches another, let him be accursed. And he said it's going to be dangerous because it's going to come from seemingly pious, sincere ministers. That's what made the doctrine called antinomianism so dangerous because it was in the hands of some very uh, fine, uh, good living men like Dr. Crisp, who was one of the founders of that anti-law movement back during the Puritan age anti-law they they cast aside the burden of the law and the reason it was so accepted because the men who preached it seemed to be so pious and i tremble when i hear paul warn us that satan's going to come right into the church disguised as an angel of light he's going to infiltrate into the church with his own ministers they'll come angel like he said preaching a false gospel of righteousness for such are false prophets false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light 
Therefore it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. Paul said they're going to come and they're going to glory in the flesh. They're going to glory in their might, their money. They're going to glory in their bigness, their numbers. And they're going to glory in the fact that they are so contemporary. They're going to glory in their acceptance by the world. Jesus warned, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They're to come like gentle sheep, sincere, intelligent, bright, but set inward their ravening wolves. And folks, Jesus gave that in the context of his message. He said, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. And the very next verse, he says, beware of false prophets. You're going to come in sheep's clothing, but they're ravening wolves. It's Christ himself warning us. False prophets, false pastors, false evangelists, posing as, sub as submissive sheep. You're going to come saying the way is not that narrow. The way is not that straight. And they're going to accommodate. They're going to change the gospel to suit the needs of the people. Jesus puts his finger on the motives behind them. Ambition. The word ravening here. Ravening wolves in the Greek means star for recognition and, recognition and gratification. Men are going to rise starved to make it. You see it in the business world. You see it on your job. People trying to climb the ladder and get recognition quickly and folks, it's now in the ministry, full blown. Young men so ambitious to be one of the big boys, to have the biggest church, the biggest numbers, the biggest crowds. He said they're ravening wolves. And Jesus left no doubt about what he meant. And this is simply what he meant. They're going to be struggling pastors in the land and they're going to look out and see all of the striving and competition for numbers and recognition and there's going to be a growing growing pressure to expand and be successful they see the measuring of success now by how big the buildings are and how many people attend the church on sunday morning and this struggling pastor who's been faithful up to now Sees struggling young, uh, uh, he sees bright young men come down the street nearby and suddenly overnight he's pastoring thousands of people in a seeker friendly church. I read Paul's warning in 2 Corinthians 11 chapter about ministers being transformed into angels of light who believe they're preaching righteousness but they've been changed somehow into a tool of Satan and I say, God, can that be possible? Lord, is that, is that really reasonable that a man who starts right can change and become a tool of the devil in the pulpit? Am I to conclude that a man of God can start right, be a true shepherd for a season, preach the true gospel, but something of hell lays hold of his heart and his spirit, something demonic, and he changes and he becomes a minister of Satan? Folks, it's happening every day. It's happening right here in New York City. When men become dissatisfied with preaching a simple gospel and they get bored and not, not praying and they're not seeking God and they get their eyes on people and numbers and, and, and they want to be judged like everybody else, I want to be a success. Paul boasted unashamedly, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Paul said now, Brethren, the, the, the Jews and the Greeks are trying to make us accommodate our message now. The Jews want us to give them signs and the Greeks want wisdom. They want miracles over here and over here they just want ten steps on how to cope. They want wisdom. But Paul said there will be no accommodating. Let them call our preaching foolishness. Let them say it's out of date, that it's not contemporary. He said, I've determined to preach nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. This other gospel accommodates the sinner in many ways. But there are three areas of accommodation that the Holy Ghost grieves over. And this, I felt the grief of God on these three areas of accommodation where people have, where ministers are changing the gospel to suit the crowd. Number one, the accommodation of man's love for pleasure. 
Know this also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And the Greek word for pleasure is sensuality, lust, voluptuousness. In other words, exciting, gratifying, sensual pleasures. And all folks, here's the danger. Oh, they're going to be pastors on judgment day. Hear these awful words, son of man, I made thee a watchman. You were to hear the word at my mouth and give them warnings from me. You were to tell the wicked, thou shalt surely die. And you gave them no warning, nor spake to warn the wicked from the wicked ways to save their lives. These same wicked men will die. These same wicked men did die in their sins, but now their blood I require from your hands. God demands more than coming to the cross. He demands going through the cross. And that's the offense. That it takes everything a man has and owns and trusts in. You see, the offense of the, the, the sinner is most willing to come to the cross and kneel before it. He's willing to take the claims by a single confession of faith and, and just to say, yes, Lord, I believe. He wants all of the benefits of the cross. He wants to believe that Christ is sacrificed, yes, and covered all his sins. Now, folks, that's being preached. The cross, though all the phraseology is there, it's sweetly talked about the cross. Come to the cross of Jesus and be forgiven. There's not one word about saying, going on with Christ into the tomb and to die. There's not a word about going down into the grave and coming out resurrected in newness of life. It's coming to the cross, kneel, say a prayer, and go back to your sins. Go back and no one say a word. You take it by faith. You are now the righteousness of Christ. No dying to sin, no being resurrected in newness of life. Now that's the offense of the cross. That you go all the way when you come. He demands full obedience. He demands everything we have. And I'm afraid a majority of people who claim to be Christians and saved in these last days have been to the cross, but they've never been through the cross. They've never been buried with Christ. Paul said, I died with Christ. I was raised with Christ. I was crucified with Christ. I not only came to his cross, I picked up my cross. I went through with him. We have another gospel now that tells men what the cross did for him, but not what it wants to take him to. The gospel, folks, is not just forgiveness. It's not simply believe and get heaven someday. It's not only the saving of the soul, it's the saving of the body. This flesh. God says, I want your flesh. I want your body as a living sacrifice. And that's the preaching of the cross. Folks, I don't care if, they, if somebody could gather a crowd of 100,000 people in a stadium and they could turn to me and say, Pastor Dave, you're wrong. Look, 100,000 people that have come through my secret friendly church and here they are. They're all believers now. But folks, I wanted you to know something. If those 100,000 people have not been given the full gospel of Jesus Christ, has not been preached fully, if the claims of the cross have not been laid there, and if they've been coddled and comforted in their sins, that 100,000 have been made twice a child of hell than ever before. They're in worse shape because the Bible says they can come now and hear the words of the curse even and bless himself in his heart saying, I shall have peace though I walk in the imagination of my heart and add drunkenness to thirst. Because a false peace has been given to them that they can live in their sins. Never be rebuked. Never be reproved. Never see the claims of the cross. That he not only died to deliver man from, from the thought of sin and the idea of sin, but the dominion of sin in his own life. If the preaching of grace doesn't have as its goal righteousness it's another gospel for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we shall live soberly righteously and godly in this present world intellectuals cursing Christ liberal minds who say there's no hope and you tell me I'm going to come in 
with a 15 minute skit and I'm going to have a cute little worship team giving little ditty bop songs to a dying world God help our blindness and from the first time I stood in the pulpit I preached repentance I preached the cross I said I'm not we are not here to comfort you in your sins we're here to confront you in your sins and to believe that there's a Savior who'll deliver you do you think for one moment we would ever stand the Carter myself or any of our men any of our teachers would stand in this pulpit where drug crazed people come to visit people half dead people crying and yearning for just one word of hope you think for one minute I'm going to give a 20 minute sermonette to ease their mind no I am so glad he laid hold of my heart one day I'm so glad he revealed his heart to me. And I can say with Paul the Apostle, he revealed his, uh, he, Christ revealed himself in me, not to me, but in me. Hallelujah. And as, as long, I know as long as this man is in this church, as long as I'm in this pulpit, there will never, ever be from this pulpit an accommodating gospel. Ever an accommodating gospel. Thank you.